are. Oh, there you go. The other um, side. Action. <laughs> I guess we're live, huh? <laughs> we are. <laughs> Alrighty. We're. Uh, I don't know what was so funny there. It's, uh, maybe my wife, because it's uh, my beautiful wife. It's her birthday today. I don't know what was so funny right there, but maybe just me appearing. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we did a video Tuesday, <clears throat> the part two of the True Mercies of David. We're going to get into that. Uh, but first, I have to say that uh, uh, if you want to comment, we we take all comments on the on the YouTube. And uh, uh, but if you want to comment, uh, starting with harassment, you may not, you may or may not like my comment. Just a forewarning, because this is not a work zone. Why well, I don't have I have a bright yellow shirt on? This is the truth zone. Bright yellow shirt. Warning. Caution. Anyway, <clears throat> we're minus a couple tonight. Uh, the girls are working my uh, uh, English uh, students, so uh, we can't be doing any English tonight learning because uh, and grammar because my, my students are gone. Uh, we are, again, looking at this board. <clears throat> we still remain. <clears throat> Some of the stuff that was over here I added to. This was uh, from uh, last week. I added to that and all of this right here. Of course, we will not get through all of this tonight, uh, but we have to get to uh, the question. And that is, we're going to get into that tonight because it matters when you get into here and it matters when you get to here. It matters when you get to here. And it really matters when you're here and down here. Actually, the whole left side of the board right here. And that is, like Harry said, it asked, where do I fit in? <clears throat> so if you turn to Ephesians 1, we have these people right here, us, or, which are the yees in Ephesians. That's where Harry is going to fit in. And we'll start at, uh, we'll go ahead and start in uh, 113. Get the gist of it. We won't do uh, 12 because that's these folks over here. That's on the left side of the other board. <clears throat> and Paul writes, and whom ye also trusted that after ye, we can say Harry heard the word of truth, the gospel of his salvation, uh, and whom also that after Harry believed, Harry was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, what's that wherefore, therefore? You got to go up and read what Paul just said. I also, <clears throat> after I heard of your faith, the ye's, and the Lord Jesus and love and toward all the saints, these Ephesian saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is Paul's prayer. And I pray this. I try to every day. Sometimes I lack in that for the folks here and for this is my family here, for the extended family that's not listening. We have a panda down in Texas, Tom, and we have a couple over in England. Other than that, I don't know who all this is. But people do view, sometimes maybe people do too. I don't know. Uh, uh, we would like feedback. Uh, let, just let us know where you're from. Uh, we're not going to beat you up and harass you for money. Uh, we don't do that here. We don't pass a plate. We don't get you warmed up with all praise and worship, as they call it, to reach down deep in your pocket and take it out and add zeros to the checkbook, and then it bounces, and you can't make your car payment. We don't do that here. That's down the street. Paul's prayer here in verse 17 is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the yees that he just spoke about, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. <clears throat> There's one big word in here that's only three letters, and that is may. That God may give it to you. Doesn't mean he will, because I'm going to tell you this right here. If you're stuck in a Baptist dispensation or a, a denomination or Pentecostal or even a mid uh, denomination, God is not going to give that to you because your mind is already made up. Why should he, why should he open your eyes to anything? Because uh, like one said, I don't need to study. I already know. No, you don't know. God is true, and you just made yourself a liar to saying you don't need to study when your main verse is 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved. You just lied to yourself by saying you don't need to study, you already know. 
may give, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of the inheritance is in the saints. He wants the yees, these folks over here, to understand what is the glory of the inheritance in the saints, these folks over here to the left. He may give you that, and he may not give that to you. That all depends on you. You have to do the study. You have to be open to what the word says. What does it say? And then you argue about what it says? Why should he? He's wasting his time. Anyway, let's see what these folks over here said. Let's go to Acts 20. That's the last time that Paul was with these Ephesians in Acts 20. <clears throat> Let's go to verse um, Acts 20, 20. Paul, or Luke writes, it is Luke, and we're going to get into Luke in a minute, even though it's not on the board. Uh, I told Val our, right before the uh, study a while ago, uh, I have to reiterate this while I said study, this is a Bible study, so therefore what we do is we study by goal. There's from no Genesis up here. But there's no revelation up there, but within that sandwich, we are studying that because all scripture is profitable for doctrine, not just Romans through Philemon. So I lie to you. You believe that because we're going to get into why Romans tonight is some of the stuff is not for you. And you have got to ask yourself this. Is that really me? Anyway, 2020, how, and Paul writes to these Ephesians, the saints over here. How I kept nothing that was profitable, kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And in verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto you myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify. What is this gospel right here? That gospel right there. That is a gospel. Paul calls it the gospel of the grace of God. Now, let's go to these Romans. Let's go back to Romans 1. <clears throat> we got Pete, repeat, Pete, repeat. Folks say Paul only taught one gospel. We just read one gospel, which folks say that went all the way back to here. And that's not true. If you've been tuning in, if you haven't, that's your loss. We just got the gospel of the grace of God, which is for these folks. That's how Harry fits in. Let's talk about that for a second. How does Harry fit in? <clears throat> Back here, there was a covenant made with Abram. And I will bless thee that bless. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. Harry would have been one of these Ephesians over here that worship the goddess Diana. Harry fit in this promise, all right. He did not bless the seed, or Abram, or the seed of Abraham, but he did fit into the other part of the promise, and that was Harry had a curse on him, okay? He was cursed, and he was without hope of God in the world, Ephesians 2.12. Aliens from the covenant of promise, alien from that. Alienated, what he says in Colossians. <clears throat> How does Harry fit in? When we go back to Rome, before we get to see how Harry fits into that, we're going to check these other two Gospels out. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. That doesn't say the gospel of the grace of God. It says the gospel of God. Romans 1.16. Let's look at this one. <clears throat> it amazes me on this verse right here. People get down to the semicolon. And they quit quoting this verse. And I ask them why. Well, they can't explain it. That's why. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of, it doesn't say God. It doesn't say uh, the gospel of the grace of God. It says the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of Christ is we're going to find out when we get over here, <clears throat> especially here. And we're going to get into, it's not on the board, I don't think, but we might look at it. Uh, in Thessalonians, where Paul says, our gospel, when he's writing to the Thessalonians and he says, our, 
who do you think the hour is? But now we're going to go see where Harry fits. Harry don't fit in the hour. Harry fits into your. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 2 5. <clears throat> and we're getting into the middle wall petition right here. The problem that these people had in Ephesians, the two groups of Ephesians, both one body, but one had promises, ordinances. The other, they got something for free. Harry gets it for free. Paul and the old boys that didn't eat pork say, We've done this. Why can't we get it for free? Why, why are they getting it for free? So there was, there was a, a, a lot of confusion, a lot of animosity, if you will. Paul breaks it down, making one new man. And in 2.5, Paul writes, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Paul doesn't say by grace are we saved. 2.8, for by grace are ye saved. Harry fits into that ye. I fit in that ye. If you're watching, you fit in that ye. Why does Paul not say, for by grace are we saved? Why does Paul not say that? You can't get answers out there in mainstream mid X because they do not know. But I'm going to tell you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift. It's free. There's no covenants attached. There's no promises attached. You don't have to find a Jew today to get this free gift. You believe it. You trust it. Ephesians 1.13 says you trust. Verse 9, not of works. What's that work? Blessing a Jew. That's what that is. Religion wants to make that works. Well, getting baptized, walking the aisle, praying at the altar 40 days and 40 nights and fasting, whatever. It's not what Paul is talking about. You know, if you're high horse, that is blessing you. I know you don't like it, but be that as it may. So Harry back here at this time, these Ephesians at this time were promised one thing. You're going to die and you're going to perish because you're without hope of God in the world. But because Israel fell, salvation came unto the Gentiles. Because of their fall, salvation came to you. Okay? It's no longer a promise for you. And by grace, God said, though these people right here are cursed, I'm going to bless them anyway. That is grace, folks. I Then he opened, tells Timothy, a ransom for all. This is many. Christ's earthly ministry was many. Genesis through Malachi was many. You were never in that. It was unsearchable. God reached down and said, though he was cursed and he's doomed, I'm going to save that man anyway. Just trust him. Because Israel's now out of the way. Forgiveness is taken care of. And we're going to get into that. Okay? People, I want to tell you right now, folks, there's going to be a controversial segment right here tonight. People don't like it, and I don't care what they don't like. They cannot, they cannot find one verse that tells them, how do I get forgiven? You find that one verse, yeah, I'm talking to you in there, that one of them out on, on YouTube, go ahead, find me one verse where it says, how to be forgiven. And I will look at that, and I will reconsider it. But you're going to have to add another chapter to your Bible, unless you're using uh, Joseph Smith's. Anyway, let's get to the topic at hand here. I just want to spit a little bit of that out. We're going to go to uh, this promise we talked about a while ago. And we're going to see where Paul fits into that promise. And you look at what people say. Let's follow Paul as he follows Christ. They want to use 1 Corinthians 11, 1, but they don't like reading 1 Corinthians 11, 2, talking about those ordinances. If you want to follow Paul, during this dispensation, the dispensation of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9, 17, if you want to find that, in this dispensation right here, you have to be one thing. Let's go ahead and look at that right now. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two. Let 
Now, this book right here, I'm going to say, is <clears throat> you had Romans written and 2 Corinthians written probably in Acts 20, verse 3, Paul went down there for three months. Okay. I'm going to say this was the last one written before he wrote the Ephesian letter because you don't find where he's talking about the Jews, but the Romans, you find where Abraham is everywhere. The promises are everywhere in Romans. Then as a translational book into going from uh, getting out of the hope of Israel, going into how you get your salvation. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11.22, pay close attention to these words. They may hurt your feelings, but caution with the shirt this is the truth zone, not a work zone. Are and he's talking about these. Are they Hebrews? Question mark. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Paul says, I am the seed of Abraham. Let's go to Galatians and see what he says about that. To the folks that we've been talking about over here for the last two or three weeks in Acts 13 and 14, Galatians 3, verse 29. And if you be the ye, being the Galatians here that he's speaking to, the folks in Acts 13 and 14, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul was an heir according to the promise. That's why he could say in Ephesians 2, 5 and Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are ye saved and not we. Folks don't understand that. They get all confused about this because they don't want to believe and they want to delete me and block me because the two sendings thing, okay, that there are two different Gentiles and they want to sit there and think that there's, there's a schoolmaster right there in chapter 3. The, the, the law was their schoolmaster. The law has never been your schoolmaster. You've never been under the law. You didn't know the Ten Commandments when you were growing up. You can't even probably quote them now. And you do not live by them like these folks did back here with 613 laws. So the schoolmaster, the law was not your schoolmaster. You are not an heir according to the promise. Because let's go back and see who the promise was for. Let's go to Acts. We're going to get into Acts now. We're going to get into something right here that... And we're going to read some stuff that people don't like. And there's somebody out of Tennessee that sat there and said, why do we go, it's twice he said it this year. Why do we got to worry about why I asked? Well, that's 2,000 years ago. Well, Jesus died 2,000 years ago too. Paul was a minister for uh, uh, 35 years, 2,000 years ago. Why are we going to even study that for? Because we take the Bible and you know, we just don't take Romans through Philemon. When you do that, you become an heir according to the promise. You are also a child of promise, according to what you think Romans do by Leon. Let's go to Acts 13. It would be 23. Acts 13, 23. Remember, let me get it. Acts 13. While you're getting there, Paul says, and uh, you have to go 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 22. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Acts 13, 23. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. If you are in Christ, in Christ at this time, believing the gospel, you were the seed of Abraham, according to the promise. Not over here. You are aliens from the covenant of promise. Paul says, for by grace we are saved, ye are saved. <clears throat> now let's read this right here. Acts 13, 34. <clears throat> let's go and start in 33. God, I'm going to start in 32. And we declare unto you, Barnabas, and now Paul, Glad tidings, good news, gospel. How that the promise, looky there, promise it, another promise. Who is this promise? From the fathers. That's what it said over here. Christ came to confirm the promises, fulfill the promises made unto the fathers in Romans. How we declare unto you the glad tidings, how that the promise which is made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same. 
read, read it slowly. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Barnabas here, and these Jews and God fearing Gentiles, which are Greeks, in this synagogue in Presidia, in Asia. Antioch. That's who the us is here. Their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay. And as concerning that, he raised him from the dead. Now, no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, <clears throat> this next phrase right here is only in your Bible twice. <clears throat> And one of them is about 750 years before Christ. I will give you the sure mercies of David. But we're going to go back and see what Isaiah did. Isaiah say, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Let's go back and have a look. See, Isaiah 55. <clears throat> Verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. Your soul shall live. That means you will not perish. Listen to what Paul is quoting here. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You can search and you can scratch around trying to find someone that was dispensatious uh, without being a wacko, uh, like the guy that uh, talked 900 people in a drink of Kool-Aid, find out what the sure mercies of David are. You're not going to find very much on it. But Paul says in Acts 13, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Well, let's kind of look at those. Uh, let's go to Romans 11. People don't like it in Romans 9, 10, 11 because uh, it can be confusing. And I can understand why. Because you don't believe there's a difference between a Greek and a Gentile. You believe that there's one group of Gentiles, and Paul went to all of them during Romans 2, 5, 8. That will get, your, get you confused real fast. Because you think you're now back in the, in the book of Acts, calling yourself a mid-Acts dispensationist. If you are, then you're on the left side of that petition of the wall. You placed yourself there. You placed yourself under the covenants of promise. You can't be under the covenants of promise and be aliens from the covenants of promise simultaneously. There is no possible way you can do that. You got to think about these things, folks. Romans 11, 28, Paul writes, as according, uh, as concerning the gospel, the gospel of Christ, they, unbelieving Jews, are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy. We're starting to get into this mercy thing. The sure mercy. God is merciful through their unbelief. Because if God was not merciful, folks, I'm going to tell you what, for 2,000 years, you, according to this promise right here, you'd be toast if God was not merciful. Toast, and that would be blackened toast. Thirty-one. Even so, have these also now not believe that through your mercy that they may all that they may also they may here's some more maze that also may obtain mercy. I'm getting tongue tied. I can't. For God hath concluded them in all. Them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. All right, folks. You most likely had on a day of Pentecost, if you were a devout Jew, you went down to Jerusalem three times a year for these feasts. And one penny at the Peter's preaching at where all the tongues were spirits poured out. The day of Pentecost that day, you can read it in Acts 2. All these Jews came from all the different nations, and they list them all out there. Peter lists them. I'm going to just go back a little research. And after that, only 120 that night in the upper room. Out of how many thousands? Now, those folks went back home to wherever they were from. 
wasn't Jerusalem. It lists all the places that Paul went to. And Paul says right here, God hath included them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. There's most likely those people that were at Pentecost and heard about this Jesus, this Messiah, that the ones that the folks in Jerusalem slain, they crucified, but he was raised from the dead. Peter speaks about, went back home. They may have got thinking, looking at scriptures and saying, hey, uh, that, that could be something going on right there, you know, because people are slow to think that once they get something in their head, they don't want to change. They're, they're, they're happy in their, in, in, their, in their own little box, and they don't want to look outside it. So it's practical to think that some of these Jews went home, and Paul ran across them with this gospel of Christ and said, you are guilty, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can do whatever you want to out there, but though you... That day down there on the day of Pentecost, rejected Christ. You probably blasphemed Peter and helped them boys down there. God's got something for you. He's going to have mercy upon your soul. You don't know why? Because it was promised. That mercy, the sure mercies of David, is you can have now. Let's go to Zechariah 13, 1. If you've got a paper Bible, I don't think anybody out here does. But those that do have, you go to Matthew and turn left a few books and you'll find it. Don't go too far. Some of those are small back there. Zechariah. While everybody's getting to Zechariah 13, one, I'm going to have me a little sip of this go go juice. <laughs> Zechariah 13 1 <laughs> in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness in that day there's going to be a fountain open Zechariah being a prophet look what it says house of David, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Now, folks, the reason he has the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem is because not all Jews live in Jerusalem. After they were strangers, uh, about 586, where Nebuchadnezzar come down and destroyed the temple, they were scattered. Okay? So, the inhabitants and the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem there's a fountain going to be open in that day. Let's go to Romans 4. Let's see what um, Paul quotes. Mercies is also blessings, okay? Uh, so the sure blessings of David are the sure mercies of David. Paul quotes, I will give you. Isaiah didn't say I will. Paul did. So if there's only two times it's spoken in your Bible and the latter speaks it, you might want to pay attention about what is being said. And that is to these folks right here. I will give you the sure mercies of David. That was a promise to these folks. <clears throat> Let's go to Romans 4. Of course, Paul, writing Romans in Acts 20, is saying the same thing that he had said in Acts 13. Abraham promises and all that stuff. It just expounded because he had not been to Rome until he's writing to this church. <clears throat> In Romans 4, going too far. Romans 4, and verse 5, Paul writes, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Hold your thought. If you got a paper Bible, if not, we're good. it's easy for these guys to go back. Let me read this again, then we're going to go to another verse. <clears throat> but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, Paul just said in Romans 11, he counted them 
all guilty so that he can have mercy on them. You're guilty, no matter what, who you are. You're guilty that God can have mercy on you. And these people matter at this time. Hold that. We're going to go um, Acts, back to Acts 13. We're going to get into what Paul, I believe, is saying, the sure mm -hmm. mercies of David. And this verse goes exactly with this one. In Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore. There's that therefore. you got to know exactly what Paul was saying in the previous verses to get to his gist of what he's getting in this verse right here. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Christ Jesus, is preached unto you, you in that synagogue, the forgiveness of sins. Now, it doesn't say anywhere in here that you have to believe the gospel of Christ, the gospel of your salvation in Romans 1.16 it doesn't say anywhere on there that I got to believe that for the forgiveness of sins. But this is what it does say, believe it, in the next verse. Verse 39. And by him, Christ Jesus, all that believe are justified from all things which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. And by him, all that believe are justified. Well, they believe it. Well, there is a colon there with a conjunction. And what are we what are we believing? If there's an English teacher out there in this little land I got that if that listens to me, I would love for you to get in contact with me because I want to utilize your skills. And I have a lot of questions. Because I have questions uh, about this, and I am studying because eighth grade uh, English class, I made a mention once, uh, instead of uh, studying English, I did bird calls in class. <laughs> and I got a bird call certificate in eighth grade English because, and so I forego English at that time to learn how to talk to birds. I don't need to talk to birds anymore. I need grammar, colons, <laughs> semicolons, commas, uh, conjunctions, prepositions, and things like that. Birds don't talk in that language, okay? They don't use colons and conjunctions. I have found this to be so. So anyway, let's go back to Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified. What is, what are they going to believe there? I believeth on him. The forgiveness of sins, the same he said in Acts 13. When did that happen? Well. There's two groups out there. Either Christ did all the work at Calvary when he said it was finished. And that he was buried, he raised the third day. God raised him. When he justified, Christ went in that ground with every sin of mankind. Every sin was laid on that man. The world turned black, dark. God turned his back on Jesus Christ. And Christ says, why have thou forsaken me? Because he took your stinking rotten sins and placed it on his son so that he could save your miserable hide, so he could have mercy on you. So the two schools are that either Christ did all the work or I got to believe the gospel. So therefore, Christ did not leave all those sins in the grave. He got up out of the grave with your sins until you believe. Now, that's hogwash. You can't find it. If you do, it's a different chapter in your Bible. <clears throat> in verse 6, Romans 4, 6, even as David <clears throat> also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, <clears throat> when you believe the gospel, you get the imputed righteousness of Christ imputed to your account because you had nothing. Your bank account was zilch, okay? But now, when God, when you get that imputed righteousness, God doesn't see Rick Aiden. God sees Jesus Christ because I now have that imputed righteousness because my flesh stinks. 
I'm rotten to the core. But God only sees his son in me. And my wife is back there just, mm, mm, mm. Awesome. She does live with me. But it's not as bad. I, I'm not thinking in the high heavens as bad as she says. And verse 7, same, blessed, mercies, blessed, are whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the God will not impute sin. Now, let's go back to the king before David, and let's see what exactly happened to Saul. 1 Samuel 15. Now, folks, you had Samuel back here with the prophet, and his little protege was Nathan. Uh, I got to talk about two movies I've watched here recently, and one of them's King David with Richard Gere in 1985. If you want a really good uh, 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 about this era right here, a good movie that is biblical, because believe me, I've watched it enough, and I'm able to hit pause and look up every verse about what's going on in there. Very very little is off. You, you'll enjoy that movie. I recommend that movie. But I watched Exodus last night and where Moses was taking the people out of uh, Egypt and I was <sighs> gnashing at the teeth because I know what's going on and everything. If you're going to make a Bible movie, make it biblical. Don't make it a Hollywood movie and want to take and think everybody is uh, not knowing what the Bible says. I'm just shredding this one of eating those people alive because Moses didn't even have a staff. It says all the dry, they walked across all the dry ground. And here you got Moses waiting in water up to here. And uh, the little bitty goats that's uh, only two foot tall, they, they're swimming across it. And then all of a sudden at the end, he don't even stand with the staff and say uh, to the Red Sea what God told him to say. And it collapsed on uh, Ramsey's head. No, it collapsed on Moses because he's out in the middle. And somehow or another, he swam out in the middle of that Red Sea. It's a bunch of hogwash. But I do recommend King David with Richard Gere, 1985, because that is this era right here. And you can take your Bible, pause it, okay, and check to make sure the scriptures. They say on that movie, it's accounts of Psalms, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. It's not from a Hollywood script. It's from the Bible. It's a very good movie. Anyway, 1 Samuel 15. You can see right here why uh, Saul thinks God was Israel's king. They wanted to be like all the other nations on earth, and that was they wanted a king that they could see. God gave them exactly what they wanted, and he was rotten to the core, let me tell you. So, 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord had great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeyed the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice, and to hearken than the fans of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and a dietary. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Okay. Samuel came to Saul. God told Agag, he had Agag, the king. Uh, uh, I forgot what, they're all in ites back there. Everybody's an ite back there. So you can go find what ite it was. I can't remember what ite, the Hittites and all these other ites. Anyway. They were supposed to kill every man, every woman, every child, every goat, every dog, every cat. If the cat had a pet mouse, they were to kill it, take nothing. But he took the best of the sheep because he wanted to make the sacrifice, and he did exactly what God told him not to do. He kept some of the bounty for himself. For Israel, he said, for the nation of Israel. God didn't want that. He didn't want their sacrifices. He wanted them gone because of... He made a promise to Abram. They cursed 
the seed of Abraham, and their curse was exactly what God said it was. Every one of them die. But they didn't do that. And God's displeasure was in Saul. And he says here, I have sinned. Now let's go. That's David's sin, right? I'm, I'm, Saul's sin right there is that he did not obey the word of God. Now let's go right here to this covenant we're talking about. Second Samuel, while we're in the Samuels. Seven, and I believe I'm going to start at 10. Second Samuel, seven. Uh, I'll go ahead and start at 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, David, and thou shalt sleep, he's talking about David, with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away for thee. Now, folks, I've got it up here. Uh, and we'll get into it. We're not going to get into it this week. They're talking about, but I will be his father, and David will be my son. If he commit iniquity, and David did, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him. Uh, let me find it here. I uh, wrote it up, David's sin. Uh, I added it late because I changed my board. I know it's in Samuel. Anyway, uh, a little brief. Uh, Nathan comes into David. David has... Now, uh, sent the head type out with a letter which had his head chopped or he was killed in battle. Strike one against David. He had this man murdered, put him in front of the battle. And then what was worse than that, he took his wife, Bathsheba, and laid down with her and got her pregnant. So David committed two sins that according to the laws we talked about, his head would be bashed in. But here it says, I will have mercy on him. And he did chasten him. The child, Nathan told him, will not live past one week. And by God, that child did not last one week. But the next child did, the seed of Abraham, which was Solomon. And the bloodline continued all the way through to Christ. That is the seed of the Davidic covenant going all the way through there. Anyway, let's get back to it. Let's go over here. We got now uh, Paul, I mean, is quoting David saying, blessed is the man that will not impute sins. But before we get down there, let's go down to one that Larry is looking at a while ago. And uh, it's in there. And people don't like this. But 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Now, remember what David said about this blessing. It's a blessing that God does not impute man's sin to him as trespasses. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. <clears throat> Remember, this is to the folks that are the children of promise, the seed of Abraham, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, folks will sit there and take reconciling the world unto himself, and I don't know how they get it, but when God reconciled the world to himself, he went back to Genesis back there to Adam, his transgression, and started from back there, and that's how uh, for the past remission of sins of Romans 3, uh, they can go back and David's sins can be forgiven by the blood of Christ. 
That's how David didn't know how he could be forgiven because he was supposed to die according to the law of Moses. His son was supposed to die according to the law of Moses, but he sent him out of town, derailed him, be gone. But he ended up getting the bushes in the head and they, he wanted to rise against King David. Anyway, verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. God did everything on that cross that day to reconcile man to himself. Now you have to be reconciled to God. You can sit there and say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe a thing he did for me. And then you're not reconciled with God. And you will never have that peace. And you will perish. Or you can have eternal life. The choice is yours. But ye have to be reconciled to God. He did his part. You got to do yours. Verse 21. For he hath made him. Who's the helm here? Christ. Every one of your rotten sins was placed on that man that day. To be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Might and may go hand in hand. You may reconcile yourself to God, and you may not. Let's go to uh, Acts 26. We got Paul, third count of his testimony, he's in front of King of Ripa. <clears throat> And this is the uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ talking to him, uh, 26, 18. Words are read until the Christ talking to Paul. To open their eyes, who's the, there in verse 17? My people and the Gentiles. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive Forgiveness of sins. You may or you may not receive forgiveness of sins depending on you, whether you believe that God already took care of those sins and that Christ died for your sins with buried and rose the third day. That's how Harry fits in. Because back during this dispensation, let's look at Galatians 1.4. Now he says that you may receive it. Now, we've talked about that can you receive something that hasn't that's not already there? Mm -hmm. Now, you might order, as my wife did, some shoes, <laughs> some hey dudes. Okay. And she had done everything in the world to get in contact with these people that I know of. And we may or may not receive those shoes. I ain't saying any more about that. It, but as an example of everyday life, that you may receive that, you may not. Galatians uh, 1 4. Paul writes, Who gave himself for our sins? He's writing to these folks that we're talking about. The Galatians back here in Acts 13 and 14, spending 10 to 12, let's say 11 years, breaking the middle. Uh, to these Galatians, God, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God our Father. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about this gospel of Christ in uh, 7 or 8 of uh, 1, Galatians 1. Verse 1 verse Corinthians 15, 3, for I delivered unto you first, these Corinthians, that he's talking to here, of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Folks, these people back here, <clears throat> that gospel of Christ, as it said in Romans 1, 16, went to the Jew first and to the Greek. That promise of the Savior went to Israel not you. You didn't, you, were, had, you didn't have no promise. It went to these folks. Christ died for our sins. And the gospel of your salvation is wasn't back here. It was unsearchable, according to Ephesians 3. You were not in this promise. So you are not in that hour. You're in the your. 
one little letter. It doesn't change much, does it? If the Y doesn't change anything, don't be talking to me about a colon or an and or a comma. If the Y doesn't mean anything, don't be sending me messages about a colon until you can get the Y down right. So we got through Acts 26 right here. Now let's go back to, to the Old Testament again, back to where blessed is the man that his sins are not imputed to him. Psalm 32. If you had a paper Bible, we'd be wearing it out, but the electronic ones don't wear out. Yes. <laughs> Psalm 32. And people, they find it a whole lot faster than I do. Psalm 32. One, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord appeared not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. You see there, it's a psalm of David. So right here, Paul quotes David in Psalm 32. Now let's go to Psalm 103. <clears throat> Another psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let me see where I want to get here. Oh, number four. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? And you can read down through here and verse eight. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And then he says down here, verse 11. Oh, let's do a 10. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, not rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Folks, the sure mercies of David, Paul speaks of right here, blessings is, blessed is the man where his transgressions are not imputed to him. Therefore, he can say in Acts 13, 38, through this man we preach the forgiveness of sins. That is the sure mercies of David. Of course, it was how Christ was risen from the dead, and he's going to give you the gospel, the gospel of Christ, and that is through this man is preached the forgiveness of sins. And all that believe, he only listed one thing right now, that the belief was the forgiveness of sins. And once you you believe that you're justified from all things. Now, I got a question for you. David was guilty of murder and adultery. Did David have to believe the gospel, as they say, to be forgiven? Blessed is a man whose transgressions are not imputed to him. Did he have to believe the gospel before his sins were forgiven, or was his sins forgiven according to the law where he should have been had his head smashed in? That's something to ponder on. Through this man is preacher forgiveness of sins. And all that believe are justified from all things. What is justified? David's sin, a guilty, and he was justified at one point. He was declared innocent. That's what justify means. You are now declared innocent. Though David was guilty, as these people back here were, God counted them all guilty that he could have mercy on these folks, okay? The forgiveness of sins, they had to receive that forgiveness and then believe that Christ did die for those, but you can't believe that they didn't believe the gospel of God, that he was the son of God and that he was raised from the dead. There's a lot of components to this stuff, people. And there's more than one gospel. So don't sit there and come back and tell me God preached, or, or Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Coming back here to Acts 9, that is times past is right here at Acts 28, where he sits there and tells you, at, at even up to Acts 28, 
was still for the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is not you. It's for these folks right here because there is an election of grace, which we didn't get into. We'll get into more next week. This election of grace, these folks that were saved right here, according to God's grace, God counted them guilty, and he had mercy on his folks. You want to know why? They believed the gospel of Christ. They believed that God gave them forgiveness of sins and that they received that. They may receive it. Most didn't. That's why he says in Acts 13, 38, 39, that you can be justified from all things, declared innocent because David was guilty. Now, God forgave him, but was David still guilty of murder and adultery? Just as sure as the world. And he lived with that the rest of his life. Just go back and read Samuel. All you got to do is read it. But he was still guilty. You are guilty. Okay, God, whether you want to believe or not, forgave you 2,000 years ago. And if you would trust it, trust it, that he died for those sins, was buried and rose again the third day, he has saved you right here on the spot. He had declared you innocent. So your flesh was set there and say, I'm still guilty of, I just got saved today and I'm still sleeping with my neighbor's wife. Oh, well, you're still guilty, all right. That doesn't make you not saved if you trusted that gospel. You just got to clean up your act now. You got to believe that you're saved, that you're justified from all things. Trust Christ what he did. Don't trust yourself and believe in a gospel because if you believe a gospel before your sins are forgiven, are you really saved? You better think about that long and hard because once you take that last breath, it's over, folks. Either it's Christ did the work, or you do the work, and the choice is yours. And the mud clears when Ronnie divides the word of truth.